All right. So it is 6.03. It is the start of lecture number four. Thank you. And uh, again, we're running just a little bit late, giving people some time to get on, but we have a massive amount of uh, content to get to. So it uh, looks like most everybody has got uh, their homework from the last session in. And very good job, everybody. I got a little slack for the week before just hitting the like button and not putting out some good comments. So kudos to everyone. So let's uh, get started. If you have questions, feel free to throw them in there. Um, I'll apologize for how the audio may come across. Uh, the recorded session that I'll put online in the next couple of days uh, will have all of the original um, audio and video uh, cut into it so that it's it's better. Uh, so anyway, let, let's get rolling here. So here we're going to deal with the forearm and the leg. Um, again, this is just introductory information. Uh, the rest of it we will have um, a lot more detail. Uh, matter of fact, I started working on um, comp compiling all of the advanced information into this online format today. So should be um, good to go there. Let me move that out of the way. Okay, so what we'll look at today is um, in the, now this looks like a long list and it is, uh, but in the forearm flexor and forearm extensor, we're going to have a single on, on, on this introductory, we're going to have a single uh, uh, dry needle for the forearm flexor group and for the forearm extensor group. Uh, we'll touch uh, briefly on the three-dimensional anatomy of these structures, but uh, where we really want to focus today is on that common, which is always the, the first treatment approach, uh, kneeling through uh, the muscles in bulk. We'll then move up to the upper leg and the posterior thigh. We'll look at uh, kneeling of semitendinosus, membranosus, the biceps femoris, and adductor magnus. We'll go to the lateral thigh. Here we'll go after sartorius and then all four muscles of the quad uh, into the lower leg. Uh, anterolateral, tib anterior, extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, and then the peroneals. Then we'll move to the superficial posterior lower leg, gastroc, soleus, plantaris, and then <clears throat> the deep posterior leg where we get to popliteus, uh, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, tib posterior, and then we'll hit four uh, of, the, of the main ligaments that we see in the lower body. Um, clinically the patellar tendon or the patellar ligament uh, the lateral collateral medial collateral and then down in the ankle foot uh, we'll needle the achilles and then up a little higher at the musculotendinous junction at the end of the, the lecture obviously we will have a post lecture assignment uh, this one will be more of a thinking assignment uh, where i haven't given you the answer it's just um, uh, going to be a little bit of some thinking on your part so a couple of pieces of supporting evidence I uh, just went and did some re, um, uh, search for a couple of pertinent things. And this one by Uger uh, from, uh, where's it from? Uh, oh, this year, uh, January of this year. And they looked at the use of dry needling versus corticosteroid injection to treat lateral epicondylitis. Um, they had 108 patients. Tech pain wasn't relieved by three weeks of first line treatment. Uh, and they're included. Uh, minimum follow-up duration was six months. At the results, seven patients were excluded. Um, so 101 patients were uh, evaluated. Uh, the groups were similar in age, in terms of age, symptom duration, and PRTE score. But after treatment, uh, dry kneeling treated patients showed better improvement in the PRTE score than the corticosteroid treated patients. Uh, patients. So the conclusion, the dry kneeling and corticosteroid injection both afforded significant improvements during the six months of follow-up. However, compared with uh, corticosteroid injection, dry needling was more effective. We look at a second piece, uh, Caballos Leda. Uh, this is from 2019, uh, effects of dry needling in the hip muscles in patients with hip osteoarthritis. Um, their patient's um, treatment was into the iliopsoas, the rec fem, uh, TFL, and gluteus minimus. I would have selected some different treatment points clinically myself, but this is what they did. Um, they also looked at pain intensity, passive hip range of motion, physical function, at, both at baseline and then after three treatment sessions. 
the results decreased in pain intensity, increased hip range, improved physical function following the dry needling treatment. And they were statistic statistically significant compared to the sham group. So conclusion was pain, hip range, physical function improved after the application of DN and an active, of course, they use motor trigger points of the hip muscles in patients with hip OA. So a couple of studies um, supporting the use of dry needling in some uh, fairly common clinical things that we see. On clinical decision making, I'm going to vary a little bit from what I've done in the last three lectures. Here I want to talk about how to identify which muscles are demonstrating the neuromuscular dysfunction. We want to first determine the orientation of the muscle fibers, then we want to palpate across the muscle fibers to find the ropey muscles, and then we want to palpate along, not along, but along the muscle fibers to locate the focal points of dysfunction. That brings us to the first video of the day. So a, a little on clinical decision making to how to identify which muscles are involved, which are experiencing any sort of neuromuscular dysfunction. Um, that those are the tissues that we want to end up dry needling. And so a, as we get later, as you get more experience going through the treatment protocols, uh, you will find that you you go target these specific areas for, uh, first. Uh, but for now, I just want you to focus on the exact finger breadths that uh, we're identifying in, in, in the labs. Uh, so one thing we want to do, we know that the patient comes in complaining of uh, pain in the lateral, lateral arm, tennis elbow type symptoms. So obviously one thing we want to do is find out, you know, what, what, what is the exact muscle? That'll tell us where we want to needle. And so one thing we want to do first is be aware of the orientation of the muscle fibers. Uh, here in the, the wrist extensors, fairly straightforward. Obviously, the muscle fibers are going to run from proximal to distal. Uh, other muscles, say in the deltoid, important to understand how that muscle comes across from its, its uh, point of origin over to its attachment. Uh, so first thing we want to do, identify that direction of the muscle fiber. Second thing we want to do is in each muscle, so we'll go through our manual test to find out, uh, especially in this group, which, which muscle we're dealing with. Uh, so again, same thing we want to do is we want to palpate across that muscle fiber. Here we're, we're looking for which structures, which muscles have that ropey sensation in there. You do that, you should feel almost a rope or, or a pencil laying underneath that, that tissue. And so that'll help you identify which, which muscle you want to target. Thirdly, what you want to do is then palpate down the length of that muscle fiber. And very frequently in that, you'll find the focal point of pain. And so it's just a process to help you go through and actually find out where the real problem is. In our case, even if we've got the focal point here, I, and we, we identify, okay, that's extensor carpi uh, or extensor digitorum. We, we still then want to go through our, our procedure to identify and, and, and needle that in that place. Later, as you get more proficient, then you may find that you vary a little bit from that to actually go down to that point of tenderness. Uh, so again, just an easy way to identify which muscle we're dealing with uh, by first identifying the orientation of the muscle fibers themselves. Secondly, strumming across, if you will, that muscle to identify if it seems to be to have some tightness going on. And then thirdly, to palpate down to identify any specific focal points of tenderness. So, okay, so we've already talked about um, what we're gonna do here. Um, so let's just move straight into this. We'll, we'll start in the forearm. Um, here we'll look at, again, we're going to do this as a single uh, unit uh, for, for, for purposes of, of this introductory uh, piece. <clears throat> and honestly, clinically, that is usually very effective. Probably 75% of the time, just doing this needle for your um, tennis elbow or golfer's elbow is, is all that's required. It's when it lingers and it takes more than a couple of sticks uh, that you have to then break out uh, the remainder of this musculature. And so in this picture, you can see, um, so 
we, we talked about the common flexor uh, or the common extensor or flexor group, uh, but we also, again, this will be in a later uh, course, uh, can needle into the common flexor tendon uh, and at the tenoosseous junction. Uh, again, if that single stick doesn't do that runs across uh, the bulk of the muscle, you can get into uh, the, the, the tendon itself if there's some active tendonitis going on um, or some dysfunction there at the uh, tenoosseous junction or the myotendinous junction for that matter. So we'll look at pronator teres, and I'm going to I'm going to move from here straight into this will be in the online portion uh, for you to look at. Uh, but let's move into the 3D anatomy piece where we discuss this a little bit more detail. So skipping. All right. <laughs> Okay, so the 3D anatomy here, the, the common um, wrist flexor group at, at the elbow, this is going to be the, the structures on the medial aspect. Let's start with the more superficial muscle group. Uh, as I move this around, this is going to be all of the structures that we see uh, along that medial ridge that goes from uh, almost the midline of the cubital fossa uh, that we can palpate and, and, and test for going all the way down to uh, the electrodon. Uh, so first one, get that back over here, uh, pronator teres. So it's, and let me pull that information out. So as you see, uh, it's origin, the medial superconjugal range of the humerus, um, and also via the, the common flexor tendon, and also on the medial aspect of the coronary process of the ulna. So uh, it's got a diverse um, fade those others. So both uh, origin off of the, the ulna and the humerus uh, in this bifurcated muscle itself. Um, we look back at it. Let me bring those others back in. It's um, insertion, the middle one third of the anterior lateral aspect of the radius. So here we are in the anatomical position. Uh, the proximal um, uh, one third, it says the middle one third. I would call it closer to the proximal. Um, anyway, uh, its action is it pronates the forearm at the radial ulnar joints. The next muscle in line I'm going to, so that muscle gets really important whenever we get to the dry needle, we're going to needle. Um, that medial and the lateral group based on some anatomical structures that we have. On the medial aspect, being able to identify pronator teres uh, is, is definitely uh, our landmark for uh, needling, uh, say, golfer's elbow through this bulk of muscle. So we'll move on to, let me reduce that. The next one in the, in the row is going to be flexor carpi radialis. I like that. And so, as you can tell, it's got a, uh, again, a proximal um, origin. Uh, there are the medial epicondyle of the humerus, uh, again, via the common flexor tendon. So this one, though, we're going to be seeing all of, of the remainder of these um, muscles. Uh, it shows them being very distinct, uh, but it generally referred to as being a single common uh, tendon and structure across all of those. Uh, it inserts the palmar aspects of the bases of the second and third metacarpal bones. So very far distally. Um, and you see that in, in yellow there. So uh, flexor carpi radialis uh, crosses uh, the, the carpal uh, rows themselves. Um, and then its action is it flexes the hand at the radiocarpal or the wrist joint, and it abducts the hand at the radiocarpal and the midcarpal joints. Tendination is the median nerve. We move from there. Let's see. If, there we go. The next in the row is going to be the palmaris longus. So pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, and then palmaris longus. Uh, for, for that muscle, again, that, that would be, as you see down at the wrist, if you resist wrist flexion, that's going to be that tendon that pops up right in the, in the carpal row. 
uh, its origin, the medial epiconal of the humerus, again via the common flexor tendon, it inserts into the palmar epineurosis in the flexor retinaculum of the hand. And so again, that's what we're going to see pulling up your resist wrist flexion. It's going to put some tension on uh, that uh, uh, palmar epineurosis. Um, innervation in median nerves, seven and eight. We move lastly to the flexor carpi ulnaris. Get that highlighted, perfect. Uh, here, the origin again, medial epicondyl of the humerus via the common flexor tendon, and then the proximal two thirds of the body, the ulna, and the lacrimal of the ulna. So, this, whenever we do start to talk about uh, our specific uh, protocols um, when, when treating for um, ulnar nerve uh, entrapment, um, we can actually come in. Um, this flexor carpi ulnaris is very important for uh, uh, treatment of ulnar nerve entrapment. And we can, can really do a, a good job of moving there and get a little bit more specific down into uh, the ulnar collateral ligament. And there's another that we'll talk about when we get to that. Uh, but those are the four more superficial medial muscles uh, that we deal with when we're kneeling there. So let's also now go take a look at the deep musculature. I'm going to switch. Where did I go? Here I went. So for the deep musculature, uh, here we're going to look at flexor digitorum superficialis, a profundus, and then flexor pollicis longus, and then the pronator quadratus. Uh, flexor digitorum superficialis, close that there. I've got it. I've got it hidden or faded at the moment, uh, but let's pull that up. Uh, it's origin medium of condyle of the humerus, again, via the common flexor tendon uh, in the sublime tubercle of the ulna and the proximal half of the anterior border of the radius. So really large footprint as far as its origin. And in certain of the pulmonary aspects of the body's middle phalanges of the index middle ring in the little fingers. And again, the actions here is it flexes those same uh, digits two through five. Innervation is C7 through T1 via the median nerve. We go a little bit deeper uh, and look at flexor digitorum profundus. Bring that back around and zoom back in. And so profundus sits deep to the superficialis um, origin of the medial aspect, the coronoid process of the ulna, the superior three quarters of the anterior medial surface of the body of the ulna, and it inserts in the pulmonary aspects of the bases of the distal phalanges of the index middle ring and little fingers, and their action is flexing, again, digits two through five. Uh, here again, uh, innervation, the medial part, curious thing, medial part is the ulnar nerve, C8 to T1, and the lateral part is the anterior interosseous branch of the median nerve, C8 T1. So one of the few times we have a single muscle innervated by different nerves. Um, so ulnar and median nerve innervation. We get to the flexor pollicis longus. I like that. So we see here its, its origin is the anterior surface of the radius in the adjacent interosseous membrane of the forearm uh, with the insertion into the palmar aspect of the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. And so we, we, we know we, we, we cover a lot of territory here. Let me come in and I'm gonna hide that, uh, uh, ten, that, that sheath so that you can really see the distance there. So flexor pollicis longus. Uh, we go finally to pronator quadratus here. Our origin is the anterior aspect of the distal one quarter of the ulna, and it inserts into the anterior aspect of the distal one quarter of the radius, and its action is pronating the forearm with radial ulnar joint. Uh, innovation here is um, anterior interbrachial neurosis nerve C7, C8. Okay. 
so with that medial group, whether we're dealing with um, tennis or I'm sorry, golfer's elbow or or what, whatever we're considering. Let me get that back up. Good. Um, it could be for pain. It can be overuse. Uh, frequently can be used with, say, spasticity from um, some sort of a neural neural uh, neural uh, incident, say with CVA, stroke, etc., uh, for reducing uh, spasticity. So, depending on what we're seeing going on, um, a lot a lot of potential uh, for reducing that neuromuscular uh, problem that we're dealing with. So, uh, the surface anatomy lab. Um, when we get to the advanced course, all of this is going to be very pertinent for what we're dealing with right now. I'm going to leave this for your review. Uh, we will get back to the, the, the meat of all of this. Um, several lectures from now, uh, but let's get into where we are uh, most interested. And actually, it's going to be that one right there. Um, so let me get to this. So a driving link vein, the common uh, wrist flexor and extensor, we, we want to uh, look at some specific surface anatomy. Uh, first thing we want to do is identify our cubital crease. Very simply, we're going to come across um, that, that location right there. Then what we want to do is find our cubital triangle here. We talked about the danger zones. We want to stay out of this area as much as possible. And so first what we'll do, uh, this triangle is, is, uh, is bordered by brachioradialis and then pronator teres. So first off, we'll identify uh, brachioradialis. You're going to have your subject hold and resist flexion. As you do that, you can identify the medial most border of brachioradialis. So as we're doing that, go ahead and relax. We come up again. Very good and relaxed. That'll help me identify this border. And then what we want to do is come in to identify the medial most border is we're going to just place our finger in that cubital window and we're going to resist, resist pronation. So if you will, we'll hold your hand down. And that will give us that border there. So from there, I'll mark there. So this is our danger zone. We want to stay away from here. When we do get to dry needling, the, the, uh, the extensor group will be lateral to this spot, and the medial group will be medial. So for the flexor group in treatment, uh, we'll find that medial and lateral treatment is, is very similar, becomes quite simple and basic, quite honestly. As you can see, I've marked um, on uh, brachioradialis, uh, the location where we'll needle. You can see right here where we had, we, we had marked those uh, areas. And if I remember right, you had a piece of homework that was uh, specific to, to this. We just identified the crease and then came down. Uh, but let's get into the, the treatment. And matter of fact, I mean, we've got it here, but I've got the video that has all of this information uh, the, the biggest thing is uh, we're going to needle uh, one thumb breadth distal to the biceps insertion. Um, we're going to advance it into an anterior to posteromedial direction away from midline at about a 45 degree angulation. And we'll use our fingers on that backside to determine proper depth. We want to make sure we get through the bulk of all of that tissue. At the elbow, for the common flexor group, the patient again is going to be in the supine position. Needling here will be 30 to 40 millimeters, and there is no backdrop. Our precautions are the basilic vein, the ulnar nerve, the posterior ulnar recurrent artery and vein. So in the supinated position, we're going to palpate for the bicipital insertion into the radius. We're going to grasp the muscle belly of the flexor group medially, and then one thumb breath distal to the biceps, insert the needle, and advance in an anterior to posterior medial direction away from midline at a 45 degree angulation using the fingers to determine adequate needle depth. Okay. 
sorry, my graphic is in a little bit of the way there, but uh, we just split um, pronator teres right there, move just a little lateral or about a thumb breadth distal from the bicipular insertion. And the needle uh, orientation is away from midline at about a 45 degree angle. You can see my fingers on the backside providing uh, a palpatory um, place for proper depth. Okay, so that's the common form uh, flexor, uh, or actually it's a common wrist, ex wrist flexor at the forearm. So let's move into the extensor, uh, very similar to what we just talked about for the flexor group in the extensor. Later, we are going to needle each and every one of these muscles individually. Uh, we'll go through the test to make sure we're identifying the right uh, group, right muscle. Uh, here, however, we're going to just go for that, that common um, extensor group um, to, to do our introductory needling. So I'm going to roll through a lot of the, the material here, which is here. We're going to cover it in 3D anatomy. So we'll come on. Get there. All right. Okay. Okay, so let's move into the um, the lateral um, elbow uh, muscle group. We'll look at the superficial muscles, and then we'll move into the deep um, musculature. Again, we're going to look at the muscles that follow in a, a very predictable uh, line of attachment that can be palpated and followed from proximal down to distal um, on, on the lateral aspect. So first muscle, we'll come in brachioradialis. Uh, we've talked about this one before, but let's, for our purposes, we'll look at it again. So brachio brachioradialis, the origin is the superior two-thirds of the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus. It inserts into the lateral aspect of the distal part of the radius. So we come way down. Um, and, and so its action is it flexes the forearm at the elbow joint, since that's the only joint that it passes. Um, that, that's its action. It's innervation by the radial nerve, C5, C6. The next muscle in line is going to be the extensor carpal radialis longus. Here, our origin, let me rotate a little bit. Uh, again, uh, the inferior one third of the lateral supraconical ridge of the humerus, our surface anatomy, our palpation, we need to be able to identify that so that we can then differentiate uh, these muscles, both brachioradialis and ECRL. Uh, it inserts in the dorsal aspect of the base of the second metacarpal bone. So we get closer in. Um, so here we have brachioradialis uh, as its insertion. Uh, and then come further, uh, we see ECRL, the longest, attaches to the base of the second uh, metacarpal bone. When we get to ECRL brevis, we'll see that it attaches to, right here, into the third. Right there. Okay, but back here. So here, our action extending the hand at the radiocarpal uh, joint and abducting the hand at the radiocarpal and mid-carpal joints. So that, that, that motion lets us identify a little radial deviation, a little extension, resist those, let us identify those, uh, that, that musculature itself. Okay, so innervation is the radial nerve, C6, C7. Again, we'll move up and look at extensor carpi radialis brevis. Here, its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. So we're, we're, we're off of the a lateral epicondylar ridge. Now we're actually on to um, the lateral epicondyle. And here's the start of the muscles that will form the common extensor tendon. Later, uh, dealing with specific protocols, we'll talk about dry kneeling into that, that common extensor tendon. Uh, again, the insertion is the dorsal aspect of the base of the third metacarpal. It's actually, again, extending the hand at the radiocarpal joints or the wrist and abducting the hand at the radiocarpal and midcarpal joints. Innervation here is the deep branch of the radial nerve, C7, C8, and the posterior interbrachial interosseous nerve. Move further laterally, now we're at the extensor digitorum. Again, its origin is the lateral epicondyle of humerus via the common extensor tendon. It inserts into the dorsal aspects of the bases of both the middle and distal phalanges of the index, middle, ring, and little fingers. It's, um, its action is extending the, the, 
second through the fifth digits, and it's innervated by the posterior antebrachial interosseous nerve C7 and C8. We finally move to our more lateral location, uh, extensor carpi ulnaris. Again, uh, origin is the lateral epicondyle humerus via the common extensor tendon, and also the posterior border of the ulna. You can't really see that in this uh, representation. Uh, it inserts the medial aspect base of the fifth metacarpal bone, and its action is extending and adducting the hand at the wrist joint. It's innervated by the posterior interbrachial interosseous nerve C7 and C8. So let's move back to the library. Let's look at the deeper musculature here. So there's our superficial, extensor deep. Okay. So here, let's close that screen. All right. So a lot easier to visualize these muscles without the superficial on, so I take those off. First, we'll look at the supinator. Um, so just the visual representation here. Um, let me get that all the way over. So the origin of the supinator is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and the supinator crest and the supinator, supinator fossa of the ulna. So again, a bifurcated muscle with uh, two different bony um, origins. Its insertion is the anterior, lateral, and posterior aspects of the proximal one-third of the radius. So strong, powerful uh, mover there. Um, action, supinating forearm at the radial ulnar joint, and it's innervated posterior interbrachial interosseous nerve C6, C7. We'll move to the adductor pollicis. Sorry, abductor pollicis longus. Get that highlighted, and we can see that its origin, the posterior aspect of the proximal half of the ulna, and then the middle one third of the radius adjacent to the interosseous membrane of the forearm. Its insertion is the lateral aspect of the base of the first metacarpal bone. Get that turned all the way. And it's that 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 unique origin and insertion that gives that muscle its, its ability to, to perform its action, which is abducting and extending the thumb at the first carpal metacarpal joint. Again, innervation is C7, C8. We will move to the extensor. Pollicis longus. Right, and I've got it faded at the moment. Let me bring that there. So extensor pollicis. Uh, longus, its origin, the posterior surface of the middle one third of the ulna, uh, and the adjacent interosseous membrane of the forearm. Its insertion is in the dorsal aspect of the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb, and its action is extending the thumb. So uh, it and the abductor pollicis longus both play a role in extension of the thumb. Um, its innervation. Uh, C7, C8, the posterior interbrachial interosseous nerve. We then get to extensor pollicis brevis in between those two previous muscles. So extensor, actually let me, now let me fade that. Okay, so extensor pollicis brevis. Uh, the origin is the posterior surface of the distal half of the radius and the adjacent interosseous membrane in the forearm. It inserts into the dorsal aspect of the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb, and again, it extends the thumb. Uh, again, it's C7, C8. And then lastly, the extensor indices. Get that highlighted. Which, uh, its origin on the posterior surface of distal one-third of the ulna and the interosseous membrane. Uh, it inserts into the extensor expansion of the index finger. The way out here. Um, and, and it extends that index finger, and again, innervation is through the posterior interbrachial interosseous nerve, or C7, C8. So, again, um, a lot of this um, surface anatomy we'll get into in our, in our later advanced course in the elbow. Um, well, it'll be good to know whenever we get to those things. Right now, uh, we've got some a little bit simpler. Uh, anatomy uh, to look at. Uh, and matter of fact, for this common extensor, sorry, I had a brain melt, uh, extensor group, we've already done 
the surface anatomy when we drew everything for the medial. So we've got the brachioradialis is going to be our lateral border for this um, piece itself. So I'm going to skip through that for time's sake. And very similar to what we did on the medial group, here we are for the lateral, the extensor group. Same distance, uh, same orientation, 45 degrees away from midline. Again, using the fingers to, to determine uh, adequate needle depth. At the elbow, for the common extensor group, we're going to need all the muscles as one unit. Here, your needle uh, length will be 30 to 40 millimeters. There's no backdrop. Precautions here are also radial nerve, the radial collateral artery, the radial recurrent vein, cephalic vein, and the muscular branch of the radial nerve to so the brachioradialis, and the accessory cephalic vein. So in a supinated position, we're going to palpate for the bicipital insertion into the radius. We're going to grasp the muscle belly of the extensor group and then one finger breath distal to the biceps insertion. Uh, we'll put the needle and advance in, in an anterior to posterior lateral direction away from midline at a 45 degree angulation using the fingers to determine adequate needle depth. So in that video right there, it, it, it appears that the needle is going completely anterior to posterior. It's probably not at a full 45 degree uh, away from midline. However, we're far enough away from that cubital crease uh, and the bicipital insertion uh, that we can get away with that. The only problem with that angulation is that I'm probably going to miss out on some of the, uh, the rest of the extensor group, ECRL, ECRB, uh, extensor dig, um, possibly um, e even further laterally. Uh, so the whole point behind that 45 degree angulation is to make sure that we uh, thread through all of that musculature. So upper arm, now let's move on to the upper leg. Okay, so here we're gonna talk through the posterior thigh here, semitendinosus, membranosus, biceps femoris, and adductor magnus. Uh, I'm, I'm giving some very introductory ways to needle these muscles as we get to the advanced uh, hip and lower leg, uh, we will find uh, different ways to needle these uh, muscles, but I want to give you some safe uh, alternatives to, to make sure we can have a nice impact on all of these structures. So we'll, we'll bypass all of the description here. We're going to discuss this in our 3D anatomy. So let me move straight to that here. So let's look at the muscles of the posterior thigh. Here we're talking about semitendinosus, semimembranosus, biceps femoris, and the adductor magnus. First, the semitendinosus. Pull that up, get that highlighted. Okay, so its origin is off of the ischial tuberosity. Let me get in nice and close so that you can see um, the attachment. And, and basically, um, all the hamstrings here with this ischial tuberosity attachment, as well as part of uh, adductor magnus on the most inferior aspect of, of, of that piece. Uh, but so semitendinosus there, we're going to come down. You'll see that it will course and go all the way down for its distal attachment um, in the medial aspect of the proximal part of the tibia it being one of the muscles uh, or the tendinous part of the, the peasant serene. Uh, Semitendinosus, its action is flexing and medial, medially rotating the leg at the knee joint and extending the thigh at the hip joint. It's innervated tibial division of the sciatic nerve, L5, S1, S2. We'll move further to the semimembranosus. So its origin again, ischial tuberosity, it actually will insert more, more laterally and anteriorly than the semitendinosus. Its insertion is the medial condyle of the tibia, so it's going to have a further uh, posterior trajectory at the joint line uh, than the semitendinosus. 
Its action is flexing and medially rotating the leg at the knee joint, and it extends the thigh at the hip joint. It's innervated L5, S1, S2. We'll look at the biceps femoris. I'm sorry, the, the, the long head, we'll look at that first. The long head of the biceps femoris, again, origin, ischial tuberosity. So its origin is actually between the origin of semitendinosus and semimembranosus. We'll get to um, a dry needling protocol, but we will actually needle through all three of these tendons to elicit a change uh, in, in those structures. Um, again, long head of biceps, its insertion is into the head of the fibula. So I'll highlight that, and we can see its distal attachment to get under the head of the fibula. It's come back up. It, it, it's actually as it flexes and laterally rotates the leg at the knee joint and extends the thigh at the hip joint. And innervation again, tibial division of the sciatic nerve, L5, S1, S2. Lastly, we'll look at adductor magnus. So on, actually before that, we also want to look at the short head of the biceps femoris. And so it, the origin, is the linea aspera and the lateral supracondylar line. And then its insertion is into the common, uh, sorry, the, the, the head of the fibula as well via the tendon. So it has an actual attachment onto the biceps femoris tendon as it, as it travels then via that tendon down to the head of the, the fibula. Its innervation or its action is going to be flexing and laterally rotating the leg at the knee joint. And its innervation is the common fibular division of the sciatic nerve, L5, S1, S2. Now we move on to the adductor magnus. And I'm going to look at it first um, in relation to the biceps, the morse, the hamstring group. So let me zoom in here. So the adductor magnus, as the name implies, it uh, covers a lot of territory. It's a large muscle. Uh, as we look at its origin, you can see it on the, the anterior uh, part of the pelvis, following the inferior um, uh, ramus all the way around that. There we go. Um, to the, the most inferior aspect of ischial tuberosity. And uh, so a broad attachment and then its insertion. Um, so again, the origin, the inferior pubic ramus and the ramus of the ischium and the ischial tuberosity. So its insertion is in the gluteal tuberosity, the linea aspera, um, the medial supracondylar line, and finally the adductor tubercle. Uh, we tend to end up needling adductor magnus in the bulk of the muscle belly, um, and depending on the protocol, we may also needle uh, directly onto the adductor tubercle, you know, all the way over there, on the medial aspect of the knee. Okay, so again, on surface anatomy, uh, future courses, we're going to get a lot more in-depth in, in identifying all the structures on the posterior aspect. For our purposes, for the introductory piece, we're going to keep this much more simple. And so we'll get to it right here. In, in looking at surface anatomy for the posterior uh, upper leg, one, one area a little bit later we'll, we'll be interested in is in being able to, to help me identify ischial tuberosity. I'm not going to mark that at this point. Another thing that's incredibly important with a lot of our landmarks, especially dealing with posterior hip structures, is being able to identify the superior most aspect of the greater trochanter. Again, at this point, for this session of, 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 of kneeling, we don't need that for our lower. Uh, but where we do need to get uh, is in, in our, similar to an elbow, we need to identify our, our window in, in the posterior lower leg. So one thing we want to do, first off, we want to identify the popliteal crease. Okay, then we want to identify a lateral and a medial margin. And quite honestly, very simply, we just want to bring the hamstrings, we re resist uh, knee flexion to identify semitendinosus, semimembranosus, wait till we get 
there. And at the same time, we can identify our lateral water, water resistance. So again, our danger zone, we, we want to avoid structures in the midline right here. When we're talking about dry kneeling into biceps femoris and into semi-tendinosis, membranosis, this is our this is our identifier. We can come lateral to those lines, medial to those those lines, and that gives us what we're looking for. Since we're here, we'll need it a little bit later. We're definitely going to want to know the, or the location of the fibular head. Uh, this isn't always the best position to do this, but we're here. And so let's go ahead and mark the superior most aspect there. Fibular head and then dropping off into the fibular neck. So as a bonus on our previous surface anatomy uh, or 3D anatomy, we were talking about um, semitendinosis as it comes around. So bonus question for homework that's not written down. This is just to check to see who's who's listening and pay attention. Uh, name the three muscles or tendons that form the pes anserine. So if you'll just include that in your, um, your, your response to the homework, that'll be fantastic. Okay, so moving on. So posterior thigh treatment, again, this is going to be very, I'm going to say simple, uh, very basic. We want to be able to, so, well, I've selected these areas so that we can, with two needle, with one needle, catch both semitendinosis, membranosis, and then with, on the lateral aspect, catch both the long and the short head of biceps femoris. But we'll get to that in just a second. All right. I'm going to take a quick note here. You see all of these screens rolling by that have all this information. Uh, at the conclusion of today, before leading into the lab coming up, I've got all of these um, slides put together uh, in, in, a, in a downloadable format that you can take. Put it on your, on your phone. Matter of fact, this is how we're going to go through our lab. You can put it on your phone, your iPad, whatever device you have, your laptop. It's just a PDF file that, that's searchable that you can select each specific muscle that gives you uh, the, the, the parameters for dry needling that. But we'll look at that in a bit. Actually, did I skip one? No, I didn't. Okay, here we go. For the adductor magnus, the patient's position will be supine. Knee length is 30 to 40 millimeters, and there is no backdrop. Precautions here for the great saphenous vein and the obturator nerve. With the patient in supine, the hip externally rotated the knee at 90 degrees flexion. Have them adduct into your hand and palpate for the prominent adductor longus. Ideally, have them rest their leg on your knee placed on the table. We'll grasp the bulk of the muscle posterior to the longus with the lumbrical grip at mid thigh and needle perpendicular to the table into the bulk of the muscle. So when, whenever we get to the advanced course, we'll, we'll dry needle adductor magnus with, with other muscle in a little bit different uh, form. Rare is uh, adductor magnus just a problem by itself. But if you do want to isolate um, adductor magnus, we'll, we'll include uh, the other adductors as well. Uh, this is just a nice, quick, easy way to needle uh, into that one specific muscle. Uh, the biceps femoris long and short head. We will come down again. We're just going to go to uh, one th uh, thumb breadth um, uh, lateral or, or proximal from uh, the apex of, of the midline here, which is about one palm breadth. And we're just going to come a little bit uh, lateral or one thumb breadth lateral to that. For the biceps femoris, long and short head. Patient again is going to be in the prone position. 
needle length here is 30 to 40 millimeters, and the backdrop is going to be either the femur or none at all. Precautions for the common fibular nerve and the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. In prone position, will be one palm width superior to the popliteal fossa. We'll grasp the outer muscle bundle with the lumbrical grip and needle from one thumb breadth lateral to midline and a medial to lateral angulation away from the femur. Using your fingers to determine adequate depth. Caution here to avoid the popliteal neurovascular bundle, which is deep, and the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, which is superficial. All right, semitendinosus, membranosus. For the semitendinosus and semimembranosus, the patient will be in the prone position with a 30 to 40 millimeter needle. The backdrop here will be the femur or none. Precautions, the great saphenous vein, the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. In prone, will be one palm width superior to the popliteal fossa. We'll grasp the inner muscle bundle with a lumbar grip and needle from one thumb breadth lateral to midline and a medial to lateral angulation away from the femur, using your fingers to determine adequate depth. Caution here to avoid the popliteal neurovascular bundle, which is deep, and the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, which is superficial. So I've been asked before, uh, whenever you insert a needle, as you saw in that, that video, uh, I, I inserted the needle, the needle fell, and then I picked it up to redirect. The initial orientation of the needle going into the skin is completely irrelevant. What is relevant is where you position it as you would start advancing that needle into the muscle. That part is critical. But getting the needle to break that surface tension of the skin uh, if it's a longer needle, it is going to fall, and there's nothing wrong with that. You just simply pick it up and, and advance it in the, in the trajectory that you should. Okay, so on to the anterolateral thigh. Here we're going to look at uh, sartorius, rec fem, and then vastus lateralis, intermedius, and medialis. So from here, let's move on to our three-dimensional anatomy. Okay, 3D anatomy of the anterolateral thigh. Uh, here we look at the sartorius and then the quads themselves. So let's start with sartorius. Um, sartorius, the longest muscle in the body. Uh, its origin is the anterior superior iliac spine. It curves from a lateral to a medial uh, direction to then insert on the medial aspect, the proximal part of the tibia being one of the three pieces of the pes anserine. Its action is it flexes, immediately rotates the leg at the knee joint. It assists in flexion, abduction, and lateral rotation of the thigh at the hip joint. It's innervated by the femoral nerve, L2 and L3. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and hide sartorius so we can have a really good look at um, the muscles of the, of the quadriceps. Uh, first, let's look actually deep at the vastus intermedius. Uh, its origin is the anterior and lateral surfaces of the body of the femur. Rotate there. Um, so distal to the greater trochanter, uh, about the line of the, the lesser. Uh, its insertion is into the tibia, tibial tuberosity of the tendon of the quadriceps femoris muscle. Uh, it's not demonstrated here, but it's through uh, the patellar, uh, the quad tendon into the patella and then ultimately a tibial tubercle through the patellar tendon or the patellar ligament. Its action is extending the leg at the knee joint, and again, uh, innervated by femoral nerve, L2 through L4. So look next at uh, rectus femoris or rect fem. 
its origin will come up nice and high. Uh, will be on the anterior inferior iliac spine in the supraacetabular groove of the ilium. Uh, it inserts in the tibial tuberosity via the tendon of the quadriceps femoris muscle and the patellar ligament. And its action is extends the leg at the knee joint and it flexes the thigh at the hip joint. So crossing two uh, joints has dual functions. Uh, innervation femoral nerve L2, L3, L4. I will hide that lip and vastus intermedius as well. Okay, that gives us down to vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. Let's look at vastus medialis first. Uh, the vastus medialis origin the medial part of the intertrochanteric line and medial to the spiral line in the linea aspera of the femur, extending inferiorly to the medial supracondylar line. So its uh, origin is a fairly broad footprint and then inserts again into, um, into the uh, uh, tibial tuberosity via tendon of the quadriceps femoris and the patellar ligament and, and that's there at the medial border of the patella. So let's hide that and then let's look at um, that, that's innervation L2, 3, 4, femoral nerve, vastus lateralis. So here, um, that hand is in the way. Okay, so its origin, the intertrochanteric line, the greater trochanter, uh, the gluteal tuberosity, and the lateral left of the linea aspera of the femur. So again, fairly uh, large footprint for its origin, and it inserts again at the lateral aspect of the patella. Uh, via the, the quadriceps tendon and tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament. In its innervation, femoral nerve L2, L3, L4. One thing of note, uh, it's not listed here, but let's let's try to put in the iliotibial tract. On the right. Okay, let's come back to it. So whenever palpating uh, the IT band, uh, you can see it actually uh, comes down and envelops the majority of that uh, vastus lateralis. However, the most prominent part that we can palpate will fall uh, right, right in line right here. So a decent amount of vastus lateralis sits posterior to the IT band that we can palpate. Okay, so surface anatomy for the anterolateral hip, uh, certain things that we absolutely need to know. Uh, one's going to be the greater trochanter. There is a lot of other uh, stuff in here that we'll need eventually. Uh, right now, the biggest things we want to be able to identify, the ASIS um, and the, uh, the pelvic tubercle. And the reason for that is we need to be able to identify especially in the, the advanced course, whenever we get to uh, the, the iliacus uh, and the psoas, as it's coming down uh, underneath or beneath the um, inguinal ligament, we be, need to be able to identify the femoral artery and so that we can know the orientation of our needling. Yes, we do needle uh, quite a bit in here. There's, there's a lot of structures that need to be uh, needled, especially for the hip, uh, hip OA, um, so uh, being able to identify that femoral artery is critical. Um, you have to be patient. You have to um, just get a good feel for it. For some people, it's harder to find. For some people, it's just very prominent and evident. Um, so uh, for the identifying the muscles themselves, we'll just move down to... Okay, yeah. So I'm just saying the biggest thing is the ASIS. I didn't even go into a big production on that. Uh, so we, we absolutely will when we get to the advanced coursework. So as far as treatment, there are what I'm going to give are one, two, three, four, five locations. Now, one thing that's going to be interesting is I want a safe placement to distinguish the uh, rec fem versus the vastus intermedius. And so for rec fem, uh, for this introductory course, we're going to needle it up high. We're going to use a specific uh, angulation to make sure that we get into that tendinous structure of, and I say tendinous, it's a mild tendinous junction right here. Uh, but we get a good response out of that muscle in that area. Um, 
truth be told a little bit later as we're doing some more advanced needling, we can drop through the bulk of the belly of the muscle itself and get through that, also get through vastus intermedius sitting posterior to it uh, and get both muscles at the same time. But I do want to be able to differentiate um, one from the other if we're looking at it as a more of a diagnostic tool. So let's let's just jump straight to it. Um, let me come down to our video. For the sartorius, position is going to be supine. Knee length is going to be 30 millimeters and there's no backdrop. Precautions here for the ilioinguinal nerve, the anterior cutaneous branch of the iliohypogastric nerve, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, superficial circumflex, iliac artery, and vein. And supine, we're going to locate the ASIS and with the knee at 90 degrees and hip externally rotated, we're going to have the patient lift the heel toward the buttocks. Uh, to, to needle the muscle, follow it two to three, three feet of rest calmly. Uh, caution for the neurovascular bundle and the femoral triangle. Sartorius is the lateral border. And insert the needle into the muscle with a medial to lateral orientation. The muscle can be isolated with a pincer grip or by bracketing. So a, a, a little short story, I had a, um, an athlete, he's a basketball, a collegiate basketball player, who had uh, finally came to me. Matter of fact, he was a son of an orthopedic surgeon. Um, he was having some, some pain uh, up around the hip. They had even gone through and done some injections in the area, uh, had gone and had started some um, uh, pain management injections. And as, as I palpated uh, and tried to use some fairly simple basic techniques to find out what was going on with this kid, uh, simply identified it as a, a sartorius problem. And he had been out of school for um, three or four weeks, uh, not been playing, um, about two sessions of needling sartorius. That pain was gone, function returned, and he was, he was back to play. So, um, Sartorius often overlooked, but given the location of there, a good assessment, a good uh, palpation assessment can give you a lot of good information on, on what you're looking for. Okay, on to rec fem. Again, this is going to be this, this, this location up high. We're going to use the greater apex of the greater trochanter uh, in line with uh, the ASIS to come down at its meeting of those two lines, and that's going to be our needle location A to P. For rectus femoris, the position is supine. Knee length here is going to be 30 to 40 millimeters. Uh, the backdrop is either going to be the femur or none at all. Precautions here are for the lateral circumflex femoral artery and vein, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the superficial circumflex iliac artery and vein, and the muscular branches of the femoral nerve. To needle the rectus femoris, we'll palpate the ASIS and the apex of the greater trochanter. We'll insert the needle where the lines of those points intersect between the sartorius and the TFL in advance in, a, in an anterior to posterior angulation. There will be no backdrop unless kneeling deeper to the vastus intermedius. So important here, we're looking more for the apex, not, not necessarily the superior most aspect, but the lateral apex, the lateral most part, and then it's just going to be anterior to posterior. Right there. For vastus lateralis, we're going to simply use the IT band as a location uh, to determine our uh, needle placement. And we will be at mid-thigh uh, for this, and we catch the bulk of, of that muscle. 
It's gonna simply be uh, lateral to medial uh, with the femur as a backdrop. For the vastus lateralis, the patient will be in the supine position and needle length will be 30 to 40 millimeters. The backdrop here will be the femur or none. The precautions are for the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the de descending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral artery. Uh, this can be treated in a direct or a threading approach. Both methods utilize the IT band as a reference. In the direct approach at mid thigh, locate the anterior border of the IT band by resisting abduction. We'll needle from lateral to medial with a 10 to 20 degree posterior angulation with the femur, femur as a backdrop. In the threading approach, we'll locate the IT band in mid thigh. We'll grasp the muscle belly of the lateralis and advance the needle in an anterior to posterior direction towards the table about one finger breadth medial to the medial border of the IT band, using your fingers in the posterior side to assist in determining the appropriate depth. So a direct approach, looking for the femur as a backdrop. And then here we'll look at the thread, the threading approach. Either way is satisfactory. Uh, maybe position patient, a uh, patient position would be the indicator of which, which one to do. Um, e either one gives us a really good response. We will get through a little bit more bulk of that muscle through this um, threading approach. Okay, then vastus intermedius. Again, we're going to take a midpoint between the ASIS and the, the superior aspect of the patella, and in, in a midline uh, along that line, we'll, we'll advance the need, needle in an anterior to posterior direction uh, with the femur as a backdrop. For vastus intermedius, patient is in the supine position and we're using a 30 to 40 millimeter needle. The backdrop here will be the femur. Precautions here are also the lateral circumflex femoral artery and vein, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the superficial circumflex iliac artery and vein, and the muscular branches of the femoral nerve. Needle this muscle mid-thigh passing through the rectus femoris. Orientation is aligned from the ASIS to the patella. We'll advance the needle in an anterior to posterior angulation using the femur as a backdrop. And then finally, the vastus medialis. Uh, again, so what we'll do is we'll use the patella as our orientation. We're going to come up about three finger breadths and then lateral, I'm sorry, medial, two finger breadths, and we're going to insert the needle and angle it just toward the femur, uh, using the femur as the backdrop. For the vastus medialis, the patient is in the supine position. Needle length here will be 30 to 40 millimeters. The backdrop is going to be the femur. Precautions, femoral artery and vein, the saphenous nerve, the muscular branch of the femoral nerve. The kneeling location is three finger breadths superior to the medial superior pole of the patella, and then two finger breadths medial. We'll insert the needle and angle towards the femur using it as a backdrop. Okay, moving on uh, down to the lower leg. We'll look at uh, three different sections here. Then we'll we'll get to the tendons, um, tendons and ligaments, and then we'll we'll be done. So in the lower leg, let's start with the anterolateral. Here we'll look at the tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, and then pronius tertius longus and brevis. 
So let's move on into our three-dimensional anatomy. And then 3D anatomy of the anterolateral lower leg. Here we'll look at uh, tib anterior, the extensor digitorum longus, uh, the extensor halsus longus, uh, sitting right there, and then the, the proneal or the fibularis longus brevis and tertius muscles. So first let's talk about tib anterior. Let's fade the others. So oops. Try that again. Fade the others. Good. I'm not sure what's happening there. Try it one more time. Fade the others. Alright. Okay, so uh, TBLC anterior it has as its origin uh, the lateral condyle of the tibia, the proximal half of the lateral surface of the tibia, and the adjacent interosseous membrane of the leg. It inserts in the inferomedial aspect of the medial cuneiform and get further down right there, and the base of the first metatarsal. Uh, its action it dorsiflexes the foot at the ankle joint and it inverts the foot at the subtalar and the transverse tarsal joints. It's innervated by the deep fibular nerve, L4, L5. Can you come up? And actually, I'm going to hide that from view so that we can now look at extensor digitorum longus. So extensor digitorum longus, the origin is the lateral condyle of the tibia and the proximal three quarters of the fibula and the adjacent uh, interosseous membrane of the, uh, of the leg. It inserts in the dorsal aspects of the bases of both the middle and distal flanges of the second, third, fourth, and fifth little toes. See that uh, out further distally. So interestingly, we'll get to this when we dry needle. Uh, we're going to use the fibula as our backdrop here. So we'll catch, catch uh, to the interior right about here. Uh, extensor digitorum longus will catch right about this area, just dropping down into that muscle right anterior to the fibula. Okay, and then oh, let me go ahead and hide that. Okay, and now uh, the extensor halysis longus. So here, uh, origin will be the medial surface of the fibula. So whereas extensor digitorum is just anterior, this is going to sit a little bit medial, um, and it's in the adjacent interosseous membrane of the leg. It inserts in the dorsal aspect of the base of the distal phalanx of the, of the big toe. It, it extends the great toe and it dorsiflexes the foot at the ankle joint to a lesser degree. Its innervation is the deep fibular nerve uh, with the root of L5. Okay, and I'm going to leave that one in place. Let's let's move up to uh, proneus longus or fibularis longus. Its origin is going to be the head of the fibula, um, of the lateral surface of the fibula and the adjacent intermuscular septa. It inserts into the plantar surface of the medial cuneiform uh, at the base of the first metatarsal. So as we see that coming down and around, there is in its insertion. So very circuitous route. Uh, for uh, uh, peroneus longus. All right. And it's also innervated by the superficial fibular nerve L5S1. I'll hide that so that we can see. Peroneus brevis. Okay. So peroneus brevis, its origin is the lateral surface of the fibula and the adjacent intermuscular septa. It is inserts in the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal bone, and so whereas uh, chromius longus uh, follows a very similar course uh, posterior to the lateral malleolus, uh, their final uh, insertion is on opposite sides of the foot. So they play a big role in, in inversion, eversion uh, there. Uh, we uh, the, the action, it everts the foot at the subtalar and transverse tarsal joints, and it assists in plantar flexion of the foot at the ankle joint. It's also innervated by the superficial fibular nerve L5-S1. So finally we'll hide that, 
and then we'll get to Peronius tertius. Here our origin is a medial surface of the fibula. Uh, the adjacent interosseous membrane and the legged insertions of the dorsal aspect of the base and body of the fifth metatarsal bone. So Peronius longus took a posterior route to attack, to insert here, and tertius inserts more dorsally. Its action in dorsiflexes of the foot at the ankle joint assists an eversion of the foot at the subtalar and the transverse tarsal joints, and its innervation is the deep fibular nerve L5 S1. All right, so our surface anatomy, we'll take a look at that. For surface anatomy of the lower leg, especially the anterior lateral, anterior lateral aspect, we want to first identify the patellar border or the apex, the inferior pole. From here, we can have our, our patient extend the knee briefly to help identify the medial lateral and relax borders of the patellar ligament. And I marked it on the other leg, but we next want to look at the fibular head. We use the fibular head in a lot of our, as, as, a, as an important landmark for a lot of our uh, kneeling structures. Also important to identify the tibial crest. because it's going to be used on, on our kneeling here as well. Since we're here, we also want to be able to identify our joint line. Because that will be useful for identifying our lateral collateral ligament. Use it medially as we come along to identify our medial collateral. I'm not going to draw it, but we also want to be able to identify our lateral malleolus and our medial malleolus. So a lot more surface anatomy that we'll get to whenever we get to the advanced uh, portion of, of the knee and lower, lower limb. Uh, for, for what we're going to do in this session, uh, these structures give us everything that we need. For sur sur Okay, so the anterolateral lower leg treatment. So six different structures. Um, we'll start with the tib anterior. So whether it's shin splints, whether it's uh, drop foot, uh, whether it's just some other sort of pain. Tib anterior is probably one of the, the more common ones to, to needle uh, on the anterolateral aspect. So let's move straight into that. So here, uh, needling point is going to be one to two finger breadths distal to the tibial tuberosity and then two to three finger breadths lateral from the tibial crest. And we're going to just use that lateral tibial surface as the backdrop. For the tibialis anterior, the patient will be in the supine position. Needling here will be about 30 millimeters with the backdrop onto the tibia. Precautions for the anterior lateral genicular artery, the anterior tibial recurrent artery, the circumflex fibular artery and vein, the anterior tibial artery, the anterior tibial veins, and the deep fibular nerve. The kneeling point will be two to three finger breaths distal to the tibial tuberosity and one to two finger breaths lateral from the tibial crest. We'll needle from anterolateral to posteromedial with the lateral tibial surface being the bony backdrop. Caution regarding the deep fibular nerve, anterior tibial artery and veins at the interosseous membrane. If the needle goes posterior to the tibia, there is risk of contact with those structures. So in just a moment, we'll look at uh, extensor digitorum longus. Uh, there will be a very similar needle placement. The biggest difference is going to be the needle 
orientation and angulation. Whereas this is lateral to medial, anterior to posterior, that one is going to be more anterior to posterior down to the fibula as the backdrop. For the extensor digitorum longus, patient gets in the supine position, knee length will be about 30 millimeters. There will be no backdrop. Uh, precautions for the anterior lateral genicular artery, the anterior tibial recurrent artery, the circumflex fibular artery and vein, the anterior tibial artery and the anterior tibial veins, and the deep fibular nerve, the lateral sural cutaneous nerve. Here we're going to palpate the anterior surface of the fibular head. We're going to move three finger breaths distal and insert the needle into anterior posterior angulation. The muscle is su superficial, 15 to 20 mill millimeters of depth, and you might contact the fibula as a backdrop. And more often than not, I do choose to use the fibula as the backdrop just to, to guarantee that I'm in the bulk of, of that, that, that muscle that I'm trying to target. So we'll move further distally down uh, to for extensor hallucis longus. Here will be four to five finger breadth superior from the apex of the lateral malleolus and will be one finger breadth lateral from the tibial crest. Uh, we'll be, have a lateral to posteromedial trajectory with the tibia as a backdrop. The extensor hallucis longus position, uh, supine, preferably on a bolster. Uh, knee length is about 30 millimeters, and the backdrop is down to the tibia. Precautions here the anterior tibial artery and veins, the deep fibular nerve. Extensor hallucis longus can be best palpated as the patient extends the great toe. Knee length location will be four to five finger breadth superior from the apex of the lateral malleolus, and then one finger breadth lateral from the tibial crest, and a lateral to posteromedial trajectory with the tibia as a backdrop. Caution of the anterior tibial artery. And then proneus tertius this is going to be fairly similar in its needle placement, maybe just a little bit inferior. <clears throat> it's going to be located four finger breadth superior to the lateral malleolus, anterior to the lateral fibular border. The needle angulation here is lateral to medial uh, with no backdrop. Now I say lateral to medial, away from midline. So technically it's going to be medial to lateral. For peroneus tertius, position again, supine on a bolster. Knee length is 30 millimeters with no backdrop. Precautions here, superficial fibular nerve in the perforating branch of the fibular artery. Needle location is located four finger breadths superior to the lateral malleolus, anterior to the lateral fibular border. Needle ang angulation is lateral to medial with no backdrop. So I stand corrected on my previous comment. It is lateral to medial as that muscle moves more from the fibula towards its insertion on the fifth um, metatarsal. 
So as I said, it originally is correct. Stand corrected. Okay, now to the other peroneal muscles, the peroneus longus, uh, it sits in the proximal two thirds of the fibula and we will be four finger breadths distal from the fibular head. We're gonna bracket the muscle belly and we'll needle lateral to medial using the fibula as a backdrop. For the peroneus longus, the patient will be in the supine position. Knee length will be about 30 millimeters. The backdrop here is going to be the fibula. Precautions for the anterior lateral genicular artery, the anterior tibial recurrent artery, the circumflex fibular artery and vein, the anterior tibial artery, the anterior tibial veins, the deep and common fibular nerve, and the lateral sorocutaneous nerve. The muscle sits in the proximal two-thirds of the fibula. So four finger breaths distal from the fibular head will bracket the muscle belly in the lateral to medial using the fibula as a backdrop. And then peroneus brevis. Here, the muscle sits on the lower third of the distal fibula. The needle angulation is perpendicular to the fibula, three finger breadths superior from the peroneus tertius needle point, which is partly why I needle uh, peroneus tertius first. Um, it's four, which is four finger breadths superior from the apex of the medial malleolus from lateral to medial with the fibula as the backdrop. For Peroneus brevis, again, supine knee on a bolster. Knee length is about 30 millimeters. Our backdrop here is the fibula. Precautions, the lateral sural cutaneous nerve. This muscle sits on the lower third of the distal fibula. The needle angulation is perpendicular to the fibula, three finger breadths superior from the Peroneus tertius needle point, which is four finger breadths superior from the apex of the medial malleolus. And we're going to go from lateral to medial with the fibula as a backdrop. So in the event that you're needling peroneus brevis and don't feel a need to mark or, or needle peroneus tertius, that math would be seven finger breadths or a palm breadth plus just a little bit more uh, to, to ensure that you're into uh, that distal third of the fibula to get into peroneus brevis. Okay, so now superficial posterior, our gastroc, our soleus, and our plantaris. So we'll move on down, look at our 3D anatomy here. All right. For our superficial uh, posterior and lower leg uh, muscles, we'll look at uh, the plantaris, the, the gastrocnemius, and the soleus. So let's start, let's actually start uh, with, with gastrocnemius. Uh, both the lateral and the medial head, the lateral head the origin is the lateral condyle and lateral supracondylar line of the femur. So it crosses that joint line to, to attack to, for its origin. And then it inserts into the posterior surface of the calcaneus via the calcaneal tendon. Um, its action is plantar flexion of the foot of the ankle joint. And because it crosses the knee joint, it also uh, flexes the leg uh, at the knee joint. It's innervated by the tibial nerve S1 and S2. On the medial head, again here, uh, its origin, oh, get that back, is the medial condyle and the popliteal surface of the femur. So you'll see it is not far from the adductor tubercle uh, where adductor magnus uh, inserts. Um, it's insertion again, posterior surface of the calcaneus via the calcaneal tendon and also plantar flexion of the foot and flexion of the leg at the knee joint. Innervation again, tibial nerve S1, S2. So I'm going to hide 
gastrocnemius. Okay, then we'll look at, we're here, let's look at plantaris. Uh, plantaris, its origin is the lateral supracondylar line of the femur, femur, so it's going to sit just medial to the lateral head of uh, the gastroc. It inserts in the posterior surface of the calcaneus, so long tendon that runs just anterior. Let's see if we can still see that there. So the calcaneal tendon. Um, on, between that and on the surface, it, or posterior to the surface of uh, soleus. Uh, it's action at cyst in, in plantar flexion. It's a weak plantar flexor of the foot of the ankle joint and assists in flexion of the leg at the knee joint. Uh, innervation of your tibial nerve, S1, S2. How relevant is plantaris? Uh, it's, it, it, it's hard to say. I, I always like to think that the plantaris is the cause of a lot of posterior knee pain. Odds are it's probably not involved that much, given how, how small it is, but it is there and it can be needled, and we will cover that in our introductory dry needling uh, session. So we'll hide that and get now to soleus. Soleus, uh, the origin, is going to be the head of the fibula and then the posterior surface of the fibula and the soleal line, the medial border of the tibial, uh, tibia. So two different uh, bone origins for uh, soleus, uh, big, broad muscle uh, responsible for more power uh, for uh, plantar flexion. It inserts uh, the posterior surface of the calcaneus via again, again, uh, the calcaneal tendon. And actually, let me move that. Okay, so it's, it's fibers uh, insert much further distally into that tendon. And it, it's, it's actually, again, plantar flexion of the foot at the ankle joint, and again, tibial nerve innervation, S1, S2. So some palpation. Okay, so palpation, trying to identify that. We've got uh, our fibular head and the similar uh, posterior uh, knee landmarks. Uh, we don't really have to have a whole lot more than that for uh, for these, the gastroc, the soleus, and plantaris. So I'm going to skip playing that and move on to the needling. So these are uh, really fairly simple and basic uh, needle locations. Uh, we'll get into each of those. Plantaris. So plantaris is going to sit inside that danger zone we talked about, uh, and, and, we, and we will needle it. Our important thing is we want to stay away from midline. So we'll find where we're going to be one thumb breadth, thumb breadth away from midline, and then we're going to still needle slightly medial, slightly lateral uh, away from midline. Gastroc and soleus, as you'll see, uh, really easy, uh, really powerful uh, needling uh, with those two. So gastroc, we will, um, and and it can it can be treated in both prone or supine. Here we're going to do it in prone. Um, uh, it will be four finger breaths distal from the popliteal crease. We're going to grasp the medial, which is more common than the lateral. We're going to do both. Um, uh, head of the gastroc, and we're going to needle with an angulation from posterior medial to anterolateral, so away from midline, so we avoid uh, the, the the remaining neurovascular structures as they're coming down into the calf. For the gastrocnemius, the patient will be in the prone position. Knee length here will be 30 to 40 millimeters, and there's no backdrop. Precautions for the popliteal artery and vein, the small saphenous vein, the tibial nerve, medial lateral serocutaneous nerve, the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. This can be, can be treated in either the prone or the supine position. In either position, the four finger breaths distal from the popliteal crease will grasp the medial which is more common than lateral, gastrocnemius, and then will needle with an angulation from posterior medial to anterolateral away from midline to avoid the midline neurovascular structures. And so here we're just demonstrating um, the medial aspect 
easily could also go ahead and, and needle the the lateral uh, the the lateral as well. Um, probably not a bad idea to do that. As, as far as a protocol, I would probably limit myself to the medial. Uh, simply because we tend to see more dysfunction there on that medial piece. For the soleus, um, again, we're going to use a midpoint between the popliteal crease and the calcaneus, um, and we will come and needle both lateral and medial uh, to that as well. For the soleus, patient again is in the prone position. Needle length will be 30 millimeters and there is no bag drop. Precautions here, the posterior tibial veins and arteries, the tibial nerve, medial and lateral sorocutaneous nerve, and the saphenous nerve. This can be treated in prone or supine. In either position, at the midpoint between the popliteal crease and the malleoli, grasp the medial or the lateral aspect of the muscle belly and needle with an angulation from posterior medial to anterior lateral away from the midline to avoid the midline neurovascular structures. So right in midline, uh, midpoint between uh, the, the, the insertion and the origin, you'll also note um, a little bit later, we'll look at it. Um, that is also the myotendinous junction of the gastroc into uh, the tendon of the calcaneus. Uh, so for the soleus itself, uh, you're going to be needling truly through that myotendinous junction as you're kneeling into the soleus. Nothing wrong with that. Perfectly fine. Um, definitely medial, probably our first option, then lateral if symptoms persist. Then lastly, plantaris. Uh, here it sits medial to the lateral head of the gastroc. So we're going to needle placement is going to be one thumb breadth lateral from midline in the popliteal crease. And then we'll have a little medial to lateral angulation. Uh, backdrop will be down because it's such a small muscle. We'll have to use the femur as a backdrop to ensure that we actually make contact with that muscle. For plantaris, position here is going to be prone. Needle length is 30 millimeters, and the backdrop is going to be down to the femur. Uh, precautions, the femoral and popliteal artery, the popliteal and small saphenous vein, the tibial and the common fibular nerve. Plantaris sits medial to the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. Caution must be taken in the popliteal fossa of the neurovascular structures. Needle placement should be one thumb breadth lateral from midline in the popliteal crease at the level of the superior pole of the patella anteriorly with a medial to lateral angulation. So here we have the musculature uh, or the, the surface anatomy that we did for the posterior knee for uh, semitendinosus, membranosus, and biceps femoris. We're going to use that same angle. We're going to draw a, a, a midline. And then we're going to use the superior pole of the patella to give us our location. One thumb breadth lateral that ensures we miss any of the neurovascular bundle. And then finally, the deep posterior muscles here, the, the popliteus, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, and tibialis posterior. Um, I, I, I like needling these muscles uh, specifically for my first line of defense for plantar fascia. All of these uh, uh, muscles have ligaments that travel uh, medially and then insert on the base of the foot. And so a very good uh, first line, again, for for plantar fascia for, for needling knees. Neuro, neuromuscular dysfunction, we'll cover this later, but the neuromuscular dysfunction in these muscles, uh, because there's a low load pull on the tendons on the bottom, tend to be where we, we see most of the, the, the cause of that plantar fascial uh, symptoms. And so um, 
once we get to the, the advanced foot uh, and, and do the needling there, um, which I hope to have a, a model for that. Uh, but I digress. Um, much kinder to needle and deal with the foot up in the posterior calf than into the foot itself. So first will be popliteus. And oh, we've got some 3D anatomy. Let's go get that. And for the, the muscles of the deep posterior lower leg, here we'll look at flexor digitorum longus, flexor halicis longus, uh, popliteus, and the tib posterior. So let's let's start with uh, popliteus. Let me get a nice zoom in here. So its origin is on the um, the groove for the popliteus muscle on um, on the tibia. Uh, it starts in a medial in, uh, location. Then move superiorly and laterally to come and insert on the posterior surface of. The, I'm sorry, so let me do that backwards. The origin is the groove for the popliteus muscle laterally. And then it, it takes an inferior and medial course uh, to insert in the posterior surface of the tibia, superior to the soleal line. Um, so always consider origin. Is the broader piece, but technically, origin insertion. Uh, it's action, it immediately rotates the leg at the knee joint, it unlocks the knee joint at the beginning of knee flexion. It's innervated by the tibial nerve L4, L5, and S1. Let's move to flexion digitorial longus. So, another uh, muscle with a circuitous route. The muscles of the uh, deep posterior lower leg, uh, as far as a treatment approach for uh, why we're treating these, uh, definitely some of this deep posterior calf pain. Uh, but as we'll see momentarily, uh, these muscles all terminate on the plantar surface of the foot. So we use these extensively dealing with plantar fasciitis, uh, any of the, the plantar surface of the foot, uh, always a good option. Treat these muscles first. See if we can reduce some muscle tension, some, some, tight, some tightness uh, in those tendons as they attach on the plantar surface. Uh, but flexor digital longus, the origin is the posterior surface of the tibia, inferior to the soleal line. It inserts into the plantar aspects of the bases of the distal phalanges of the second, third, fourth, and little toes. Its action is flexing that second through uh, fifth toe and plantar flexing the foot at the ankle joint. Innervation here is tibial nerve L5, S1, S2. We move laterally for the flexor halicis longus. Here, our zoom in, our origin is going to be the distal two-thirds of the posterior surface of the fibula and the adjacent interosseous membrane of the leg. It inserts in the plantar aspect of the base of the distal phalanx of the great toe. So it's covered with a lot of connective uh, tissue there. There's a tissue. So I'm going to pause right there. So whenever whenever we're treating someone with plantar fasciitis and we 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 feel that really tight band that that's coming um, towards the big toe, uh, we always like to think that that's the plantar fascia. Well, really and truly, the plantar fascia sits more medial. Uh, most of the time, if you feel that, that is flexor halicis longus, and so. Um, Again, I feel that my very next thing is I want to needle into flexor halicis longus. You know, synovium uh, and then just more uh, tissue. Uh, it's action, it flexes the great toe and plantar flexes the foot at the ankle joint. Again, innervation is via the tibial nerve L5, S1, S2. And then finally, uh, let, me, let me come in. I'm going to hide those two to give us tib posterior. Here the origin is the posterior surface of the tibia, inferior to the soleal line, its posterior surface of the fibula, and the adjacent interosseous membrane of the leg. So again, another of the muscles with multiple bone, bony origin. Its insertion is, let me get all the way down here. Okay, so our insertion of tib posterior is the tuberosity of the navicular bone, the plantar aspects of the medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform bones, 
in the lunar aspects of the bases of the second to the fourth metatarsal bones. Its action is inverting the foot at the subtalar and transverse tarsal joints, and it plantar flexes the foot at the ankle joint. Its innervation is the tibial nerve, L4, L5. Okay. So for treatment, Poplidius, uh, well, I'll, I'll get straight to the treatment video and let it do the talking. For the popliteus, the patient position is going to be prone. Needle length will be 30 millimeters with the back drop down to the tibia. Precautions, the popliteal and posterior tibial artery and veins, the right tibial nerve, and the great staph in his vein. The popliteus inserts on the posterior medial aspect of the proximal tibia above the soleus. It extends posteriorly to the lateral femoral condyle. Grasp the medial proximal gastroc and palpate the lateral tibial border. Needle location is at the opposite level of the fibular neck, one thumb breadth lateral to the midline of the heads of the gastrocnemius. Needle perpendicular, P to A, to the tibia, and to avoid medial migration to avoid the neurovascular bundle. So popliteus is similar to plantaris. Um, superiorly, popliteus is, is a technical um, dry needle that has to be very close, uh, one, to avoid the neurovascular bundle, but two, because it's a smaller muscle, to make sure that we actually make contact with what we're trying to actually dry needle. Flexor digitorum longus. Reflexor digitorum longus. Position here is going to be prone position. Mean length is 30 millimeters, and the backdrop is the posterolateral aspect of the tibia. Precautions the posterior tibial veins and artery. What we're going to do is compress the medial gastrocnemius at mid calf and needle from posterior to anterior, from lateral to medial, with the lateral aspect of the tibia as a backdrop. We'll needle through the soleus before reaching FDL. And then for <clears throat> flexor halicis longus. For flexor halicis longus, position again is prone with a 40 millimeter needle. Backdrop will be down to the fibula. Precautions, the fibular artery and veins in the sural nerve. We're going to compress the lateral gastroc at the mid-calf and going to needle from posterior to anterior with the fibula as a backdrop. And then for Tib, posterior. For Tibialis, posterior, again, prone position, needle length about 30 to 40 millimeters, backdrop down to the fibula. Precautions here, the fibular artery, the posterior tibial artery, posterior tibial veins, 
fibular veins in the tibial nerve. To take a lateral approach, there will be three finger breaths distal from the fibular head. We're going to insert a needle and advance with a slight posterior lateral to anteromedial angulation of about 10 degrees posterior to the fibula with no backdrop. From a posterior approach, we're going to compress the lateral gastroc belly three finger breaths distal to the fibular head. Needle angulation is posterior to anterior towards the fibula as a backdrop. So for the lateral approach, we come here, and then if we want to take a direct approach, in the same three, compress gastroc and drop down posterior to anterior. Okay, onto the tendons and ligaments. We're almost there. We're just going to look at four here. Um, some 3D anatomy, just really quick. And finally, some a 3D look at uh, four of the tendons and ligaments in the uh, uh, lower leg. Uh, first would be the patellar ligament, the patellar tendon, the patellar ligament. Uh, technically, uh, it's a ligament since it connects bone to bone. Uh, however, it's frequently referred to patellar tendon. Anyway, I digress. Uh, it's attached to uh, both the tibial, tibial tubercle and the inferior aspect, inferior uh, pole, or the apex, technically, of the patella. Moving further laterally, uh, the fibular or lateral collateral ligament. Um, it's a broad band located along the lateral aspect of the knee. It originates from the lateral epicondyle of the femur and then it passes obliquely to join the tendon of the biceps femoris muscle distally to form a conjoint tendon. The conjoint tendon inserts in to the head of the fibula. Um, unlike the, the tibial um, or the medial collateral ligament, uh, fibular collateral ligament is not fused to the lateral meniscus or the articular capsule of the knee. Hence, it is more flexible than the tibial collateral ligament and less susceptible to injury. And so let's go medially and let's look at the medial collateral or tibial collateral ligament. It's one of four major ligaments of the knee joint. It's a broad band on the inner knee and attaches superiorly to the medial epicondyle of the femur. And inferiorly, it attaches first to the anterior band of semimembranosus muscle and then continues inferiorly to attach the medial surface of the tibia deep to the pes and serine. Unlike the fibular collateral ligament, the tibial or medial collateral ligament is fused to the medial meniscus and the articular capsule of the knee joints. Hence, it is less flexible than the fibular collateral ligament and it's more susceptible to injury. And then lastly, let's drop and let's look at the Achilles tendon or the tendocalcaneus. So here it is the long tendon that attaches the muscle bellies of the, the triceps surrey muscles to the posterior surface of the calcaneus. The proximal end of the tendon begins in the middle of the leg where the fibers of the triceps surrey begin to converge and form this single tendon. Uh, proximal to its insertion site, the calcaneal tendon spirals, which results in the gastrocnemius fibers inserting laterally on the calcaneus and the soleus fibers inserting medially. Okay, so for lateral collateral, the proximal attachment, I've done that. Um, needle length is going to be one and a half up to three centimeters. Three centimeters is not going to be needed um, uh, as far as total penetrating depth. One and a half to two um, uh, centimeter needle will be more than enough. Uh, no backdrop if you if you land on on backdrop either superiorly or inferiorly. There's nothing wrong with that. As we go a little bit further, uh, you'll see that uh, we do frequently tin, uh, needle into that, that soft tissue in the joint line for specific reasons.
to fibular or lateral collateral ligament. Uh, position treatment is sideline with the treatment side up. Needle length is one and a half to three centimeters. There's no backdrop. Precautions here the inferior lateral geniculer artery. For the procedure, we'll palpate and determine the lateral joint line and the lateral collateral ligament. Needle location will be at the midline of the lateral collateral ligament, lateral to medial without a backdrop. So just a quick evaluation to make sure I'm on the lateral collateral ligament. And then it's just simply going to be lateral to medial to that ligament. Okay, medial collateral, very, very similar. Medial or tibial collateral ligament. Position is supine with the knee on a bolster. Knee length is one and a half to three centimeters. The backdrop will be the joint capsule and medial meniscus. Precautions here the saphenous nerve, the articular branches of the tibial nerve, the inferior medial genicular artery and vein, and the superior medial genicular vein. For the procedure, we'll palpate the medial epicondyle and femur. We're going to slide distally across the medial joint line to locate the broad fibers of the medial collateral ligament. The needle location will be in the joint line, medial to lateral angulation, perpendicular to the scan surface, with a backdrop of the joint capsule and medial meniscus as a backdrop. So similar, want to go down the joint line, find where the medial collateral uh, bumps into your fingers, and then just a medial to lateral uh, trajectory into that, into that uh, ligament. Patellar ligament. Quite simply, we're going to find the inferior pole, we're going to find the tibial tubercle midpoint, and we're just going to drop one and a half, uh, up to three centimeters of a needle length. It won't require that whole length, and there's no backdrop. The patellar ligament position is going to be supine with a bolster under the knee, underneath the knee. Needle length is one and a half to three centimeters with no backdrop. Precautions, the patellar anastomosis, the anterior tibial recurrent artery, and the articular branch of the tibial nerve. The procedure will palpate for the midpoint between the inferior pole of the patella and the tibial tuberosity, the attachment sites of the patellar ligament. The needle location is at the midpoint and in an anterior to posterior angulation. So for patellar tendonitis, uh, needling that structure is quite effective at reducing that anterior knee pain. Very frequently, it's because there is a significant amount of neuromuscular tension in the quads, uh, the rec fem specifically, as it comes down to pull. So uh, protocol-based, I would needle that patellar tendon, but I would also come up make sure that I'm needling uh, rec fem as well to make sure that we're not just taking care of symptoms, but decreasing the load on that structure. And then finally, the Achilles tendon. Achilles tendon. Position for the patient for treatment is going to be prone. Needle length is one and a half to three centimeters. The backdrop is either the calcaneus or, or none. Precautions here are the calcaneal branches of the posterior tibial and the fibular artery, the medial sural nerve, the sural communicating branch of the fibular nerve. For the procedure, we're going to palpate for the junction of the Achilles tendon and the gastrocnemius. Here, needle location will be at this junction in a posterior to anterior angulation with two needles, 1.5 centimeters, one, one finger breadth medial, and one, one finger breadth lateral to midline. 
Distally will palpate for the attachment of the Achilles tendon to the calcaneus. Needle location will be at this junction with the calcaneus as a backdrop using a 1.5 centimeter needle pecking on a periosteum and a posterior to anterior angulation. Now, I don't always dry needle with a big black stick like that, but uh, this is my wife is my subject, and I think she had had enough needling for the day. So for demonstration purposes, actually, you can barely see calcaneus there. But um, so that is the fourth of the, the tendons and ligaments that we're going to do. And so I'm going to move on to the post lecture assignment. We have now gotten through all of the introductory material. Uh, we've got a lab coming up before we do that. Your post lecture assignment. Your patient has shoulder impingement. Pain is four out of 10 with flexion and abduction. Strength is four out of five. Uh, there's tenderness in the posterior and the lateral shorter. I want you to name six muscles that may be involved in order of likely importance. There is a there's there's a there's an answer that I want to see, but there's actually no right or wrong answer here. So that is that part of the post lecture assignment. So I want to bring so up next is going to be our lab. In this lab, there are 53 plus or minus uh, different needle sticks. Uh, as you see on this screen um, on our our student portal, I've taken I've taken all of these. Um, the, the instructions for how to dry needle, uh, and I've placed all 53 in there. Um, you'll be able to go to the student, student portal and you, you can download that. Um, I have mine on my, my cell phone. I can, I can scroll through it. I can search it uh, so that I get down to, to each one that, that, that I want to, to reference. Um, in, in the past, I've used big, thick manuals. Uh, I think I'm going to move away from that uh, so that this is much more portable. You can carry it. You get the same information right there. Uh, so for our lab uh, coming up, this this is going to be the bulk of what we're going to use for that lab. In addition, so I encourage you go go find that, download that. If you have problems getting to that, let, let us know. We can direct you to it. Um, in addition, we're going to go through surface anatomy. So uh, as you can tell, critical to especially some of these technically challenging uh, dry needling uh, sessions, uh, we have to be very specific to our surface anatomy. So, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on the first step in our lab, what we're going to do is, is identify these specific mar um, both uh, landmarks and, and muscle uh, groups. So I encourage you between now and lab uh, to, to review the information uh, in, in, the, uh, in the lectures and, and be prepared on the on very first thing uh, to, to, to draw these on your uh, fellow lab partners, because that, that's very critical in moving forward uh, to do that. As you get clinical with, with applying dry needling, um, when I first started dry needling, did I draw some of these structures? I, absolutely, I did. So I got comfortable with my palpation skills, my three-dimensional awareness of where all the structures were. Um, do I draw them now? Well, absolutely not. Uh, but, but it is a good tool to get in the practice of making sure that you identify your structures rather than just simply dropping a needle somewhere. So that'll be the, the, the first step on, on the morning of, of that lab. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me there. Um, you've made it, you've gotten through the first four lectures. Um, that's the good news. The better news is that uh, after we complete this next lab, you'll be able to take this to clinic and start using it. Um, and then there are only 12 more lectures. Uh, the, the remainder of the lectures gets much more in depth into a lot more structures. But like I like to say, probably 60 to 75% of what we treat in clinic comes from this material right here. Uh, it's the remainder of the advance that uh, gives you the people that just don't respond to the, the basic uh, dry needling piece. So um, I will see each of you at the lab um, that you've signed up for. And then after that, I will see you for lecture number five, which is the advanced cervical.